Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's conversation on Chloe Bass Wayfinding, an exhibition that's currently installed outdoors at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation in St. Louis. My name is Kristen Fleischman Brewer. I'm the Deputy Director of Public Engagement at the Pulitzer. I have had the privilege and honor and joy of bringing Wayfinding to St. Louis with a current um, tremendous team of individuals. So i um, pleased to share it with you all tonight. I'm honored to welcome and introduce you to the exhibition and to tonight's speakers, artist Chloe Bass, art historian Linda Earle, and writer and art critic Jessica Lynn. So I'll start with what is Wayfinding? Uh, in the simplest description, wayfinding is a public art installation of sculptures that takes uh, the form of public wayfinding signage. There are 32 sculptures organized in four sections around four questions, which are how much of life is coping, how much of care is patience, how much of love is attention, and how much of belief is encounter. In addition to the installation of sculptures, the exhibition includes a site-specific audio artwork that you can access via a phone call in number and via SoundCloud on our website. Wayfinding was originally commissioned by the Studio Museum in Harlem and was installed in St. Nicholas Park from fall 2019 to fall 2020. And for St. Louis, what we've decided to do is support Chloe to expand the project by adding the fourth section centered around the question, how much of belief is encounter? We also updated the audio artwork to be specific to St. Louis. Wayfinding is as much about form as it is about the poetry of our everyday lives. It's truly about offering space for personal reflection. It's also about critical social and political references relevant to our time and place. So really you can bring to it your own experiences um, in your own everyday and learn and grow um, from there. For those of you who are able I hope you can find time to come visit. The exhibition is up until the end of October. Of course, because it's outdoors, it's open sun up to sundown daily. For those of you not in St. Louis, we'll have resources online and we'll also be releasing videos um, via programming and other creative means over the course of the summer for you to experience the exhibition from afar. And with that, I will pivot to introducing our speakers. So Chloe Bass, currently based between St. Louis and New York City. Chloe works in performance, publications, installation, and in social spaces. She's held numerous national fellowships and received prestigious artist residencies. She's also an assistant professor of art at Queens College CUNY and co-runs Social Practice Queens. Jessica Lynn is a writer and art critic, founding editor of Arts.Black, an online journal of art criticism from the Black perspective. Her writing has been featured in publications such as Art in America, The Believer, Freeze, The Nation, and elsewhere. She is the recipient of a 2020 Research and Development Award from the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts and the 2020 Arts Writer Grant from the Andy Warhol Foundation. Linda Earle is an art history, is art history faculty at Tyler School of Art and Architecture, Temple University where she's building a curriculum in fine arts management that centers cultural and ethical issues, creativity, and critical skills. She's worked in the arts as an educator, administrator, funder, and curator, and as an advocate for inclusion and development of new platforms for cultural practice, participation, and discourse. So both Jessica and Linda were invited by Chloe to contribute writings in support of Wayfinding. You can find their full essays in print in the museum exhibition guide and also in digital forms on our website at pulitzerarts.org. They'll also be reading excerpts tonight and getting into a wonderful discussion together. So thank you, Chloe, Linda, Jessica, and thank you to the partnership of Michigan Gallery at CUNY. Um, also a special shout out to my colleague, Josh Stulen, who helped organize the exhibition and this program tonight. We're planned to last uh, about an hour this evening with a Q&A. So uh, as we get through this, please be thinking of questions and you can toss them um, in the Q&A. And um, you know, we thank you so much for joining us. And with that, I will hand it over. Six, graphic wayfinding. Graphic information is the most direct way for people to find their location. Typical graphic wayfinding information includes systems made up of text, pictograms, maps, photographs, 
models, and diagrams. Visitors are required to observe, read, learn, and comprehend these systems as they make their way through a site or building. 6. Apathy The loss of ability to initiate activity or conversation. It's easy to make up stories about yourself, but harder to bring them to light. In the voice you offer to another, suddenly details are missing, the patchy grass beneath a tree that looked like a lush carpet from afar. All the extra words and defensive explanations that won't take, a smokescreen of language to obscure an important truth, that the story is just a story, and sometimes not even sufficient fully to be one. Meanwhile, in the overflow of explanation grows the profound loss, everything we accrued by not giving others the chance to speak. Step 2. Applicant Qualifications An applicant to qualify must Applicants must have paid all real estate taxes on all properties that they own in the city of St. Louis and have no outstanding violations on those properties. Applicants must own property with an occupied residential or commercial structure immediately adjacent to the desired lot. At the entryway to the bridge, a woman enthusiastically waves a brown cardboard sign reading, Your Life Matters, as the cars whiz by. Marking the other end of that same span's curve, a man stares blankly, holding a sign of identical size, shape, and color. Help me. How much of belief is encounter? Thank you for this invitation. It's always a pleasure to think with you. Um, I believe there will be some images to accompany my reading this evening. I'll be pulling from three short vignettes um, in the essay, A Practice and Accompaniment. On the screen on your left, you'll see an image of me um, in a leather jacket and some green jeans on Buckrow Beach, a small beach in Hampton, Virginia, where I grew up, taken by the artist Mahari Chabwera. And on the right, you'll see a cover of Jamaica Kincaid's novel, The Autobiography of My Mother. And this evening, to this conversation, I bring the following question. What can be undone, unshaped, or reshaped through the navigation of memory as it is embedded in place? Wayfinding one, paths and circulation. Topography, now. A detailed description or representation on a map of the natural and artificial features of an area. A set spatial moment meant to represent a landscape that is otherwise moving. A snapshot. See also family photographs. When you are young and trying to ascertain the limits of your world, the task feels Herculean. There are places that you know are not your places, the not here. And yet rendering them beyond the abstract leaves you with an interesting conundrum. To whom might these other places belong? What are the conditions of their universe? Are those people where they are thinking about you? In my own mind as a child, this curiosity of place, of a place defined by a present tense, led me to the past of people who were charged with my care. I wanted to see and hear and know those geographies that had given them shape, the shapes that I could now touch and hold on to while reading, while walking in the park, excuse me, or reading together at night or line dancing at a birthday party. How had they imagined this now? Wayfinding three, nodes. A node is a point at which subsidiary parts originate. People make decision points at nodes and paths. As a result, nodes should contain graphic and architectural information to assist with those decisions. Jamaica Kincaid's novel, The Autobiography of My Mother, opens this way. My mother died at the moment I was born, and so for my whole life, there was nothing standing between myself and eternity. At my back was always a bleak black wind. This is not a sentiment of hope 
or forlornness or even despair. For Kincaid's protagonist, Suela, this is just a matter of fixed position, a node from which she shall move forward. This recognition brings with it sets of decisions that root Suela's way from childhood to old age. She negotiates the parameters of her life on a small island first defined for her by an innocent father and later renegotiated by Suela herself for her own survival. She marks her way in the world by the horizon line or the distance from her father's house to the mouth of the river or by the quiet that settles in Rousseau on a Sunday morning during church hours. This novel is the last book I read in 2020 and I'm writing about it here in 2021 because I have returned to the place of my childhood only to be slightly disoriented by all that I had forgotten about this location. I have since begun to guide myself by the memories assigned to the many places where I once clung to the shapes of those previously charged with my care, places where I decided to release my grip. These are becoming my nodes. Wayfinding two, markers. In wayfinding, a marker is an object that marks a locality. Markers such as arches, monuments, building entrances, kiosks, artwork, and natural features give strong identity to a various parts of a site or building. They act as mental landmarks in the wayfinding process and break a complex task into manageable parts. There is the church, the former church on Warwick Boulevard, whose congregation has ballooned so much that the building where I first questioned the terms of my faith is no longer the building where the church even meets. There is the park near the Air Force Base where I first realized what it meant to be disappointed by the fragile humanity of your parents. There is the water at whose edge I stood desperately trying to see to the other side, to those other universes. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, such a beautiful poetic uh, evocation of some of the feelings uh, that I had um, in exploring uh, Chloe's work. And thank you, Kristen and uh, um, Josh and, and Chloe for the invitation to talk tonight. I'm gonna to read uh, just a couple of passages from my essay, which is called Reflections on Unbuilt Space. For years, an image from Cesar Arias' improbable, brilliant novel, Ghosts, has lodged itself in, in my mind insistently, an image with which I'd been fascinated, but that I'd not entirely understood until it emerged more fully for me in Chloe Bass's work. The novel takes place during a single day and documents a construction worker's family living surreptitiously on the site of a future skyscraper. The family's lives are organized by routine, daily labor, the habits of survival. But the temporal and spatial planes of their existence are disrupted by a band of revenants who have also come to occupy the half-built space. The daughter of the family can see them, and as they beckon her to join their legion, she has a vision of the building in the present under construction in conjunction with another image that the author describes as a reciprocal mirroring of what has already been built and what will eventually be built. The all important bridge between the two inflections, reflections was provided by a third term, the unbuilt. Chloe Bass's conceptual project for me occupies this unbuilt space, generating what she's called souvenirs for feelings you haven't had yet. The substance and strategies of wayfinding prompt recognition and memory in the moment, as well as responses whose meaning and implications for how you live in the future will truly unfold over uh, the as yet unknown territory of your experience. Um, as I sort of explored the work more um, and more, and as you could see from the images we saw of the piece and the audio, um, attempts to describe the interplay of the text and material elements of the work really evoked literary analogs for me. 
I think of the clear surface of a well-wrought essay that allows you to see more deeply into the currents that run underneath it. There is a narrative you can construct from the dialogue between the four central questions on the reflective boards and the confessional asides and observations planted in the ground in the matter of didactics in the botanical garden. One of them, every time I've nearly been killed, et cetera, is in itself a short story with a long tail, so to speak. Bass's work combines the economy and heft of, of recognition offered by poetry and wayfinding in particular invites this kind of rumination. Because it uh, resides both outside the walls of a museum and outside of interpretive directives, you may navigate it with a different kind of attention, carrying it just below your conscious engagement with the text, mixed with the residue of dreams, to-do lists, um, lost keys as you wander through it. Inevitably, the news and current events of the time will attach uh, themselves to the awakening experience of wayfinding as it travels from a park in Harlem to St. Louis through lockdown calamity and relief. But wherever it is, the souvenirs it imparts will include the piece's interaction with its surroundings. A landscape carries its own narratives and applies social arrangements as the contours of uh, the natural are accommodated or uh, erased, the strictness of the paths it's on, the signage and its own wayfinding devices, the presence and absence of others. Somewhere down the road, your memory will perhaps orchestrate all of this with the questions of uh, wayfinding that have unfolded from where you are right now uh, into unbuilt space and unshaped uh, and as yet unnamed possibility. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, it's really nice uh, at your own event when you get to be the person who comes on last, because mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of ways in which wayfinding as a project has taken on this entire life beyond my brain and my body and the spaces that I inhabit. It has a public life. Um, it has a bigger public life than I do for which I am grateful. I would like the work to stand in for public life as much as possible. I do not want to be the one. And it also has this kind of literary and thought life that um, the two of you have expanded so profoundly. And so I want to thank you both so much for being here. Um, as Kristen mentioned, I invited you both to contribute text for this project. And it's worth saying to people who don't know me that I never invite anybody to be in conversation with me because I feel like I have to. I only invite people to be in conversation with me because I really want to talk to them more. And I really want to be in closer contact with their minds. And I've been so fortunate to speak with both of you before um, in different circumstances, on different topics. Uh, Jess and I in particular have had a long, slowly unwinding collaboration or practice alongside one another. And Linda, I'm hoping that you and I will have the opportunity to do the, do the same. This is now our second kind of way of yeah. finding each other. But the most important thing for something like this, I think, is always conversation. And so to let everyone know who's out there, whoever you are, um, we are just gonna talk with each other. It is my goal not that we are moderated to have a conversation that takes a kind of formal capacity of one and then the next and then the next, but actually that we're able to engage with one another in whichever way we like. And so it's my hope that we can just speak to each other, ask each other questions, hear each other's answers, take it from there, and eventually welcome in the questions of the audience as well. So Linda, I just wanted to start really quickly by asking if you could talk about the music because the mm. music was your contribution to this evening among other things. Well, you know, um, I actually first heard it in a rotation of songs um, on my uh, headphones as I walked around and I found that it I was, I found the message arresting. I find that's uh, Abby Lincoln, the great Abby Lincoln died a couple of years ago. Um, she was singing at an old age. Um, 
it seemed to impart a kind of the kind of wisdom that doesn't get recognized as wisdom uh, and gets sometimes mistaken for, um, you know, sort of casual kind of, uh, uh, it, it, well, it, it, it has such gravitas to me. Um, um, and it, as I walked around listening to it, it, I found it made me more open to what I was seeing. That interaction uh, actually made me feel more receptive. And I carry the memory of that song with memories of the um, landscape I was walking through when I first heard it. It also has the kind of generosity um, that I think you have as an artist and, and the kind of invitation to participate that you have as an artist. So it really reminded me of you and your voice. Thank you. That's amazing to hear. I like that wisdom that isn't recognized as wisdom is a phrase that really sticks with me. And I think actually something that moves across a lot of spaces and a lot of thinkers, but I think is something that I've encountered in Jess's work as well, actually, this sort of not just the wisdom that isn't always recognized as wisdom, but the space of making, um, leaving room for that kind of wisdom to emerge and to be recognized and kind of to be collected in a meaningful form. And I don't know if you would agree with that assessment, Jess, but I feel it all the time. That is such a thoughtful assessment and it's such an assessment of high praise. Um, I think I will agree with it and say that in fact, what our collaboration has meant to me um, and even recently thinking about our partnership alongside Linda and your work, I've been so struck always by this assertion that geography can be a route um, for navigation of memory in real time, but Linda, you talk about this in your essay, that it can also move us toward a speculative. And I think I'm really interested in the speculative possibilities um, of place as well, and perhaps how we pull from the geographies that surround all of us in another fashion in order to like remake or like redo or undress a thing. Um, and I feel like so much of that is a type of tension that feels really actually quite playful to me. And I don't know that I always get it right, but I feel like Chloe, you tend to get it right. Um, <laughs> so that is, that is so much of what is top of mind for me right now. I don't know if I always get it right. I'm trying to get it right. You know, like we're all just out here trying to get it right. And like, I think for me, something that has remained so evident um, to anyone who actually knows me, but really not evident to people who don't, is like how funny I want the work to be. Um, and, you know, how, how many times I'm crying as much as I'm laughing. Mm -hmm. And other people are sort of like, I saw it and I cried and I'm like, that's really great. Or, you know, I saw it and I was thoughtful or I saw it and I was rooted or I saw it and I was, no one has said they were angry yet, mm -hmm. but every once in a while, someone said, you know, I was walking through it and I was listening to the audio and suddenly I laughed. And that for me is really, really important that there is kind of this undercurrent of like very deep humor that goes alongside all of our sorrows. And I think that this happens a lot, you know, when I think about music too, there is sort of that sonic form too of the laugh, even in the blues. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just incredibly important for how we really receive and remember emotion. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I think, uh, you know, the image in the song of keeping your hands wide open so that you can give as well as receive um, uh, sort of embody some of what you're, you're saying that, um, and that it's all experience. Um, and um, I think that, uh, you know, I'm really also interested in this sort of uh, gap um, in the novel I talked about um, between recognition and cognition and, um, and I think uh, Jamaica Kincaid plays with that as well in her work. There are things you recognize and don't understand. I think, I think it is in um, autobiography of my mother that she describes an interaction with her mother and, and describes this sort of ball coming <laughs> between them 
that's um, this sort of um, almost ghost-like ball of, of their stuff. Um, and um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, uh, about, you know, the dynamic and, and why Close Piece ev evoked um, that book to you particularly. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I have been thinking about Kincaid for a long time, not because I'm attempting to be a fellow in her work, but she does a thing with autobiography generally as a writer in craft that is very fascinating to me. In fact, I was sharing with you all yesterday in a lecture she gave four years ago, I think at this point, um, an audience member asked her, like, where does the autobiographical live for you as a writer? Um, how does it show up? And she says, everything is autobiographical about my work, including the punctuation, none of it is true. And then she laughs after that, right? And I feel that scaffolding for me is deeply aligned, Chloe, with your practice. And I think it does live in this ball of haunting ghost likeness that you're talking about, Linda. Um, everything is true, including the punctuation, and none of it is true. And that dynamic and dichotomy, um, what can be moved and placed back and forth um, from a craft perspective as a writer feels akin to what's happening um, conceptually and formally in your work. And I, I don't think I had made that connection, quite frankly, not even after I finished the book, but until I listened to the lecture that she gave about her work. Um, and she is someone for whom I think humor is also deeply important. When you listen to her speak, she talks about that quite often. Um, and that line, I was like, oh, I get it. Something happened when she said that. Um, and it was just a light, it was a light bulb moment. I got in trouble like September, 2019, which feels like 700 years ago. 700 years ago in September of 2019, I was on a panel at the Vera List Center with uh, Camila Janan Rashid, who I admire greatly, with Aruna D'Souza and uh, with Laura Reykjavich. And uh, for some reason, what Camila was trying to get me to talk about was my Instagram and I really didn't want to, and she knew I really didn't want to, and that was kind of the game between us. And uh, she was, you know, trying to get me to talk about sort of how I've engaged with public formulation of emotion through projects that I do for Instagram, which I do, I do that. And uh, I was really not having any of it. And I said, yeah, there's a lot of feelings, but I never said any of them were true. And then sort of half the room was just like, what? Like, we can do that? And the other half the room is like, of course. And I sort of wonder where it falls for each of you in the kind of representation of emotion. What amount of truth do you feel like is required, not for art as a practice, but for each of you as a person in terms of like how you understand and move through a work? And where is there space for untruth or questioning as kind of a mode of understanding? I think that's I think a that's question. a big territory and a great <laughs> question, but I think I immediately thought of the ways in which, uh, uh, particularly women uh, fiction writers and particularly writers of color, when they write fiction, are asked, you know, is this you? Is this character you? And there, there's an attention to that that I've never quite understood, and it it seems to me definitely gendered and many times racialized. <laughs> and I wonder about that um, because first of all, you can't produce anything that's not part of you. That's your, your, you know, your experience is your material. And um, so I don't know how far you can get from that, um, except in terms of your insight and your imagination and your empathy, as far as that will go. Um, uh, so, yeah, that that issue of autobiography, I guess it is all autobiography. Um, and some of the great truths in art are revealed by, you know, um, speculative fiction, uh, <laughs> um, impossibilities. Uh, 
the book I refer to, uh, Ghosts, is a completely improbable premise of, you know, ghosts hanging around a, a half-built building. It, it has a social and political dimension. It takes place in Argentina, and the, and the uh, workers are Chilean, and there's a cultural uh, uh, tension going on. Um, and it's about gentrification in a very, you know, obvious uh, sense there. But And somehow it, it manages to be about that uh, with a great deal of humor and in, in, in possible situations, sort of counterbalanced by the everyday, which is something, Chloe, that you focus on, that, that everyday uh, rootedness um, and, the, and the weight of that, um, um, the things that we, we don't examine um, and unpack. But that was a long way around <laughs> your question. It's such a big question. Um, I will try to move in, in the, the way of ele elegance as you have, Linda. Um, when I think about the work, I think most recently, you know this, Chloe, that I have been trying for many years to write about family, but also not write about family. And so I bring that up to say that something about this ongoing effort and its relationship to truth is related to protection a little bit. Um, I said recently, you know, I asked recently or talked recently about how you're writing, I'm trying to write about something, many things that exist, while many of those people who are implicated in those things also still exist in our living. And so my relationship to truth is one that wants to take into consideration the fact that some of those people are still here. Um, at the same time, there's also a relationship to self-preservation as in like, what does it mean to be honest about the memories as they live on and within me without causing harm to other people, right? Um, and I don't know, I don't, I don't, I haven't gotten to that, that balance yet. I do think some of it is me navigating, Linda, as you said, how people question the way protagonists show up in a work. And I don't write fiction, but I find that I am still having to kind of move through those inquiries at many different points. Um, and so I think the truth could also be a matter of like the I, capital I, right? Um, how much of that is or maybe what is the proximity of that eye to my actual self in the world as compared to an eye that lives on the page? Um, and that is, that's such a, such an odd choreography to, to follow, you know? It's not linear. And I think that like, as we have all been talking about, there's like a refusal to think about the quotidian in these like linear ways. Um, and I think my question maybe back to, back to both of you would be given that like what does it mean to kind of like let go of something right if time is this async can be this like yeah asynchronous um plane like what does it mean to let go I, I feel like that line in Lincoln's song you know to like make way to receive something and then to give it back letting go feels distinct though it's not a giving back and so I think that's something that's also swirling around for me. And I would love to hear how you both are thinking about that. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, I'm still sort of pursuing that, that question. I mean, and that's one of the great things about um, art that sort of implants itself. Um, and uh, and keeps unfolding for you. I think uh, um, letting go um, for me it, uh, means being present uh, and letting go of the things that prevent you from being present. Um, and um, yeah, I think I you know if we have time at the end, we'll play Esperanza. Spalding in her, you know, early 30s singing that song. And it sounds very different to me. Uh, and maybe it means something else to her. And I, 
Uh, so I've been listening to both versions. Um, what do you think, Chloe? <laughs> you know, there's like, I am not a person who is sort of a student of Buddhism or Buddhist philosophy, mm -hmm. but I sort of have been ongoingly captivated by the idea of to hold with an open hand, right? Mm -hmm. Which is something that is repeated over and over again. I am not the first person to be captivated by this idea. I will not be the last, I am not an expert. But one of the things that's so interesting to me is that this idea of holding with an open hand, depending on sort of the hand that's doing the holding has very different meanings to mm -hmm. me. Um, and when I think of myself sort of holding something with an open hand, that means the freedom to come and go. But I think there's another sense in which holding with an open hand is a sort of understanding that no one will leave your hand. They cannot, the world beyond your hand is so uncertain and unknowable mm -hmm. that even though you're offering sort of tacitly the opportunity to come and go, you know that you're operating in a system where to go is to enter this kind of great vast unknown. Mm -hmm. And even in terms of like linking back to what somebody knows in their early 30s when they're singing a song versus what they might know later, right? It's sort of like between those two things is maybe in another way, the territory of the unknown in a way that doesn't have the same operation of power, mm -hmm. but where you're saying something else will anchor in me, something else will anchor in me in the future, but there's also that which I know now and I still want to give it voice. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of wayfinding actually is about that. Um, you know, these are things that I have written in my, in my mid thirties. Um, I don't know what I will think about them or how they will land for me 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, if I'm so lucky, I do know that my mother who is nearly 40 years older than I am, uh, when she first saw the project installed in Harlem, she started to cry and she cries a lot at happy occasions. So it wasn't that surprising to me that she was crying, but I was sort of, you know, okay, she's crying, kind of comforting her. And, and she said, it's just hard to walk into something that you see and you know, it's so true. Mm -hmm. They thought, oh, I didn't know that's why you were crying actually. Right, we assume a lot of things about how we understand the people that we love. And this kind of comes back to the framework of like how much of love is attention. Like, can I, by paying attention, truly know you, truly see you, or am I inventing you? Can I, by paying attention, love you in the way that you want to be loved and not in the way that I want to love you? Um, can we find ways for those things to line up? But then even in that, there are always these sort of great moments of surprise that like undo you totally. And I don't know where this all comes back to like the practice of holding, um, but I guess holding attention is its own kind of framework. And so maybe I'm closing the loop there before I get too far off course. <laughs> I was thinking uh, um, of uh, when you mentioned Buddhism and I think that's where it came from. Uh, with Abby Lincoln, but um, you know, the, the resonance of a singing bowl, which if you hold it in your hand, if you grasp it, it, it really can't make the sound it's supposed to make. You, you have to have a certain, you know, um, and I'm not an expert in this, except that I love singing bowls and I love the feeling of the vibration coming up my arm. Um, so there's something there about, um, um, you know, the rewards of, of holding your, your hand open um, in that. Um, I wanted to ask you, Chloe, about, you know, the, the idea of souvenirs for feelings you haven't heard, uh, had yet in relation to that. As you were saying about the singing bowl, I was just thinking like, it's so obvious, but obviously any kind of resonance requires space and air. Yeah. Um, so like, if you are closed off, you cannot be a resonant. You cannot be a resonant body. You cannot convey perhaps a resonant feeling or a resonant idea. Um, and I think sort of this comes back to maybe what Jess was saying about time too. I, I am trying to put something, especially when I'm doing it in public space, but really generally with my work, I'm trying to put something there that I would want to encounter. Not that I think people necessarily need, but that they would want to find. Um, and that when they find it, it will either be something that in the moment of finding has its feeling and it's kind of uh, wrapped up in that way, or 
Later, you have a totally different experience, a totally different set of feelings, a totally non-art related whatever, and you remember the feeling that you felt in the moment of seeing this work and then the loop closes and you say, oh, and I don't know who is seeing this work, right? Especially in public context, but anyway, it's not my ability or frankly, my job, because it's impossible to know the landscapes of all of the people who are seeing this work. And so leaving the kind of time open for that, for me, first of all, gives a huge amount of permissiveness that I appreciate. And I hope that it can also feel kind of generous in that way, right? But there is sort of the air and the breath and the space for resonance. It is to say, it does not have to be now. I do not know who you are now nor do I know who you will be in the future, but I know at some point we will meet each other. That is really, um, for me, raising a couple of perhaps morbid morbid questions, but I'll ask them anyway. Um, or I'll say first, I think that's what's particularly daunting when I think about your question as it relates to truth, because the closing of the loop presumes that one has the ability and the capacity to do that. But I think as I listen to you, and as I think about the many things I'm trying to work through as a writer, a question I often have to ask myself was, well, what if the loop doesn't close? And then what do you do, right? And so I'm curious if that ever crosses your mind. And if it does, what are the strategies and pathways you take to remind yourself that perhaps, yes, maybe we all have those capacities, right? Um, yeah. Sorry, my computer was just like freaking out. It's been doing it all day, it's great. My computer is closing its own loop. It is on the 10th year of its life and it's just like, it's gonna end really soon and I'm so into the process. <laughs> I know that's not how I'm supposed to feel but everything is backed up. So I'm just like, not really that worried. Um, so just a second ago, it was like, oh, you wanna click things? Like we're not doing, there's no more clicking. Clicking has ceased for the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's lots of places where we don't close the loop. And like, I'm not that worried about it. Not because I think it means that it's less likely that sometimes the loops will be closed in really beautiful and meaningful ways, but because like so much of life goes missing. And in a way, a lot of the work that I do is about how much of life goes missing and how many things we can put into the environment or into a museum or into a video or into a conversation that call us back. But even as we call ourselves back, so much more is going missing, right? And, you know, I haven't, I haven't read Ghosts, um, but I think I'm going to this summer. And I'm curious, right, in its discussion or grappling of what it is even to like be a ghost, is that an anchoring or is it like a permission to become like unmoored, unbodied and still present, like to sort of dissipate and participate at the same time. Because the last thing I wanna say about it, and then I do wanna hear about ghosts is like, I've been thinking so much about public uh, as an idea. I think about public space, public libraries, public schools, public transportation, right? These are things that really compel me. And the only sort of common ground that I find throughout all ideas of public that I can grapple with is like, the public is that which falls apart without participation. But like when you're closing the loop on multiple time scales, I don't know what the framework of participation becomes. And so I'm sort of excited by all of this now all at once. You know, it's interesting because, um, um, you know, we think of something public uh, as uh, the Public art, for example, is in, in some ways constitutive, right? It, 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 um, but um, you can walk through wayfinding by yourself and not feel part of a public, for example. Um, it can be very uh, individual experience. It can be um, the opposite of that. You can go with friends and probably get into arguments about what some of it means. And, um, and people's reactions to it. So I just wanted to say that, and, and the publics, there are many publics, but um, 
that that constitutive thing about public, what we call public art, interests me because it's not working the same way in 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 your piece. You know, it's not something that says, "Are you with me?" You know, do you do you share these values? Are you you know? Um, and I think in ghosts, um, to hop back to it briefly, it's a very slim book and a very quick read. And Aira is a, uh, he claims that it's almost an automatic process, his writer writing. He's written a zillion books. Uh, he almost has logoria, except that they're very, very economical and focused. And ghosts in this, um, the ghosts are um, something about the past and the future beckoning. I mean, they were alive in the past. If you're in a certain belief system, you will be a ghost in the future. Uh, and that's how they function uh, in, in the piece. And they're naked and, um, and ridiculous. And, but they are beckoning all the time. Yeah. I too am sometimes naked and ridiculous and beckoning. And I like it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just like in, in bringing together those that are still with us and your writing around them or of them or about them or through them, do you feel like you have this sort of encounter with that kind of same like spectrality mm -hmm. or is it very, very different in, in, in the way that you're working? Yeah, um, I, I like thinking about haunting. Um, I like thinking about hates and ghosts. I feel, it almost feels like, um, I think for me, right, to come back to this like idea of the loop, I think that I don't know if I can close the loops that are present as they exist for me if I can't talk about ghosts. Um, I've been reading Sophia Sinclair, the poet, um, her collection Cannibal and one of the sections she has a series of poems notes on the state of Virginia um, in response to Thomas Jefferson's abhorrent racist text um, but in one of the poems she asks you know like what haunts us here or that is like the central question of the poem and I think for me I've identified that as like the thing that's going to get me around the loop and to avoid it would actually be an untruth. Does that make sense? You know? Um, yeah, I hope that answers it. Or I hope that feels, you know, generative in a way that speaks to what you're thinking about. Yeah, I, in a good way, I sort of don't know where I am. And like, that's yeah. great because especially when you make something and then people ask you to talk about it in all these different ways. And in wayfinding now, because I have gone through this once before I learned from that experience. And what I learned in that experience was if I walk people through the project, they actually no longer see it. They mm -hmm. really don't. Mm -hmm. So I don't do it anymore. I don't walk anyone through the project. It doesn't matter how important they are. I tell them they need to go and I will meet them there. And then I will wait for as long as they need while they take themselves through the project. And whenever they're done doing that, I will be there again for as long as they want to talk about it. But that there's this way in which you need to usher yourself through that journey, even mm -hmm. if you're there with friends, right? That's a different way of ushering yourselves collectively, mm -hmm. but that it cannot yes. and should not be with or through me. And that mm -hmm. has felt incredibly important to know about the work and to know about how it kind of can function um, to bring people together mm -hmm. and how it also will then always contain its own life. I think mm -hmm. not just my life, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. not so interesting. Everybody's life is completely fascinating to me. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say. Uh, and Jessica, I was going to say when you, um, you mentioned you can't avoid trying to close the loop or you can't avoid the loop itself. And I think um, it goes back to the earlier question of, uh, you know, 
how much truth you have to tell to be uh, to be telling what you have to tell. And maybe that's the only rule is that you can't avoid the that loop. You can't avoid the difficulty. Um, uh, you don't have to close it, but it has somehow the writing has to acknowledge it. And that really fascinates me. I think um, those spaces are there in, in Chloe's work as well. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're really, um, really generative spaces. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I like that, you know, that maybe the effort can only ever be something like an approximation, but like we're always approximating. And when that stops, we are just not here in this form, right? But like the always approximating, um, that feels like a certain a welcoming of, of a truth. Um, yeah, I like that. Thanks, Linda. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm coming back like a ghost, um, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, thank you all so much so far. It's just been a privilege to just sit here and just <laughs> um, enjoy all the beautiful, wonderful, amazing things y'all are talking about. Um, so I, um, I'm coming back in to help guide Q&A from all of the people that are still with us. Um, so if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, so far we have one question and we'll just go for it. And I've got a couple other questions and of course we can continue going between each other. But um, the question, um, if I'm interpreting it correctly, is what is the line between practice and living or practice and life, especially because the work is being positioned in public space? Um, I think you all spoke about it a little bit, but I wonder if, you know, you want to talk about it more. I think I often think about it as um, a person organizing in public spaces, um, but also inside a museum of, of how do we, what is real life, what is public, what is institutional. So I'm curious what you all think. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very important question because actually putting work in public spaces um, a tremendous privilege to overuse an overused word, but also like it offers up a lot of potential for what the work can do and be and mean. And it offers up that potential in different ways in different contexts. You know, I don't know that anyone who saw the project in Harlem ever really saw it alone because that park has a lot going on at it. Like there's really a lot going on. And I loved that. And that was a big part of it for me. And then, you know, Grand Center in St. Louis during a pandemic at night on a weekday, like there's not a lot really going on. Um, and the project is still available, right? So it's like the museum, technically the sites are closed and not a lot of people are necessarily down there at certain points of the day. But if you were down there, you could still see it you could see it to some extent if you were just driving by, and then you could see it in a different way if you got out and were walking around. And I think that the relationship between the practice of making this work and the living is this ongoing one that is way beyond me, right? I try to bring that into the work before I put it into the world. I consider it as carefully as I can, but then it keeps going in ways that I sometimes uh, someone tells me about and a lot of ways that I will never be privy to know. And so in that way, it makes its own sort of echoes in the life that it carries and the meaning that it makes that I that I never know about. Yeah, thanks, Chloe. I see the person who posted the question said, really asking about the difference between practice and living, which I feel like you, you started to get there. So, um, oh. Yeah, okay, like practice and living my life. I mean, hmm, it really varies from project to project because there are some projects that have sort of taken over my life in this very specific performative way and I allowed that to happen. I set up those structures, I was in control, but also it happened. Um, and, uh, you know, some projects that have not done that and Wayfinding is not a project that has done that. It's a project that really is based in observation, research and encounter, but not the direct living of those spaces in my body um, for long periods of time. But I will say like, perhaps the difference between practice and living has something to do with structure and intent. 
And in practice, there is sort of a level of structuring and a level of intentionality that we can bring to our everyday lives, but we, not all the time, I think, uh, even if we want to, it's impossible to do all the time. And it's difficult to do all the time in your art as well. But when you do it, it is seen as being um, uh, strong or aware as opposed to being controlling, which it might be in your everyday life. So it's interesting when you do the exact same thing in a slightly different context, what it means about who you are to someone else. Yeah, and I mean, Jessica and Linda, you know, you might be able to expand upon that question too. I mean, with your work in the different context and, you know, Jessica, you talking about, you know, writing and writing about your family and, and you, you know, how you, um, how do you, you negotiate those? Yeah, when I think about that question, I think a lot about the nature of, the nebulous nature of nonfiction, um, which is to say that I don't think that I'm living in order to write about the thing. Um, so much of what feels entangled in what has emerged on the page recently um, is not actually real time per se. And I also think the kind of structure, to borrow from you, Chloe, of nonfiction, it, it does this thing with the eye that I was trying to think through earlier. Um, that yes, there, there is some of me in this work, um, but it is not um, the me, like the pieces of me that are collected every day, like moving out in the world. And I think nonfiction is a very interesting genre. And I think the relationship that I have to that space um, craft wise still has me kind of scattered a little bit, um, but I think mostly about this, yeah, this idea that like, I'm not necessarily writing in real time, that so much of what's coming up is out of time actually. Um, and somehow it still can be true. Well, I, um, I haven't written fiction in a long time. Um, uh, but um, but I'm getting back to it weirdly. But in my own practice uh, over time, um, which is you know running arts organizations and supporting artists, um, the the issue has been for me uh, whether institutions can metabolize values in a way that. Um, I think expresses uh, my personal, not only my personal vision, uh, and, and usually not my personal vision, but uh, human values. And, and uh, can institutions be, uh, behave humanistically? And um, and how how does it um, metabolize criticism, for example? Um, so that's my sort of life practice uh, connection. I think uh, that's that's what I keep in mind about my own sort of interaction with the field. But um, yeah, I wonder about it institutionally, but it's a great question. <laughs> I feel that one pretty hard. Yep. <laughs> so I'm always asking that question. Um, thank you all. Okay, we're gonna take a hard left and we're gonna talk about materials. So there's a question about the use of mirrors in the work. And I think, you know, you could expand upon that a little bit more broadly in terms of scale or, or other materials, audio or sculptural. You know, my background is in theater and performance. And so in terms of making sculptures and objects, it's just been this like whole interesting situation where I see things in the world, just normal things. And I'm like, ooh, how do you make that? Um, and I, I love doing it. It's really fun, but like, that's actually how I do it. It's not, it's much more intuitive. It's not so, uh, not so educated in that respect. Uh, there are a lot of parts of this project that are like highly considered and kind of highly educated, but that is not one of them. And I have a few different answers to the question about mirrors. One is that my parents have a mirrored coffee table and they always have. 
And uh, yeah, so I grew up as a really little person, you know, on sort of the same level as the coffee table, just sort of like always seeing myself in that surface. Um, and they still have it. It's 2021. I think we've all changed a bit in our design sensibilities, but there's a mirrored coffee table still in their house. And we're kind of always still like reflected back in that as part of any family gathering in our living room, which is interesting to me. Um, then separately, right? This is the sort of answer that people know more, but it's not less true just because people know it. There is this larger conversation about what it means to put something into the landscape at a monumental scale. And although a billboard is not quite a monument, it is very large. And given the current conversations around monuments and not only what it means to make them, but what kind of monument gets supported and what that sort of reflects back about the moment of society that you're in when the monument is made, I was interested in putting something into the landscape that gave the landscape back. Um, so it's not a mirror that's designed to look into. It's not a selfie station. You can sort of see yourself at certain points, but it's really designed to show you from wherever you're standing and as you move around and as you shift your body, the different things that are around you that are also shifting and can be seen and called to attention in that way. So that's why I used mirrors. Um, but probably just because we all have a fascination too with that kind of reflectivity. Thanks, Chloe. I, um, those are all of our questions I feel like we've gotten to so far. Um, if anyone has any last questions to share, you're welcome to post them, but I, I also think we can, we can close out. And if there are any final things you know, that you all would like to leave people with, we can do that. Um, and I, you know, I should say, you know, in closing from the, the Pulitzer end, it's just, um, you know, gratitude for this conversation, for this project, all of it. I hope people can come see it. And if you cannot get to St. Louis for all the reasons in our lives right now, um, you know, we will be sharing about this project. So, um, with that, you know, if there's any closing comments from, from you all, and then we'll let everyone enjoy their evening. Thank you, Chloe. It was, it's been a pleasure to think about, about this work. It's been really yeah, generative like for me. I mean, I'm so happy just to sit and talk with both of you for an hour um, <laughs> about anything, really. And so I thank you for coming together in service of this project. Thank you to Kristen for hosting this work. Thank you to Josh for hosting and stewarding this work. Um, and to the Pulitzer and to the Michigan Gallery also for co-sponsoring this conversation and offering it back to the com CUNY community, which is another very important public for me. And also to the person who's clarifying your question, I see that you're clarifying your question and as an educator, like I super appreciate it because we don't, we don't always know what people mean when they ask something. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't have an answer to what you've clarified, but you've clarified that it's the, the difference between work and life and how my work seems to exist outside of that binary of work and life. And to, to that, I can only say thank you and thank you for kind of sticking with it and making your meaning known because that's all I think that everyone who is here is trying to do. All right, y'all, so we do exit music. Okay, thank you all. Enjoy your evenings. Thank you everybody for coming and thank you again to everyone who was with me here. <laughs>